loving, kind, and heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us on this Sabbath thus far. We thank you for the message given to us during the Sabbath school hour. We thank you, Lord, for the song we just heard leading us into thy presence. We ask now for the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to our hearts as we give you our hearts, as we give you our lives. We pray that you will even reform, change, revive us, convert us, bring us to deep repentance, continue to help us to become more like Jesus. As we hear these words from your word today, may we heed the invitation to repent, to turn our lives to thee. And as we study the great departure, Satan exercising his power over the remnant, may we search our own hearts to see if Satan is exercising power over us that we may surrender. And may you help our church, help our church, dear Father to be revived and reformed before you come is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome those online as we open God's word this afternoon. Our subject for this afternoon is entitled The Great Departure Satan to exercise his power on the remnant. The great departure, Satan to exercise his power on the remnant. Just look at the screen for a moment and take a picture of that. Look at that picture for a moment as Satan is the conductor of a train. And we're told in Sister White's writings that the whole world is on board Satan's train and they are on their way to perdition. She saw many people on the train. Satan was the conductor. And today we're seeing, my friends, that Satan has the world on board this train. And even those who profess to be Christians are on this train. And God is trying to get us off that train to perdition and get us on the road that leads to life. Right? We say amen. And for those online tuning in with us, we pray that by God's grace, you will get something from this message today. Look at the screen, friends, as we study God's word. Testimony to the church, volume 1 page 215 paragraph 2 and lets us know that God's ministers are not just to preach the cross and Jesus Christ not just to preach smooth messages God's ministers must bear a pointed testimony for these last days you should bear a living pointed testimony stand out of the way of the work of God and step not in between God and his people I can just hear God saying right now to his ministers get out of the way let the truth Reach my people. Get out of the way. Don't mix my truth with your feelings. Let the truth cut. Get out of the way. God is correcting and proving and purifying his people. Stand out of the way that his work may not be hindered. Ye will not accept a smooth testimony. Ministers must cry aloud and spare not. One more time. Ministers must cry aloud and spare not. The Lord has given you a powerful testimony calculated to strengthen the church and arouse unbelievers. I have been shown that the Lord is reviving the living, pointed testimony, which will develop character and purify the church. So God's last day ministers must have what kind of testimony for these last days? A living, pointed testimony. And God's ministers must get out of the way. Today, I don't want to stand between God and His church. I will not stand between God and and the message for the church, I am going to get out the way. Let the Lord speak to his people. Let the Lord speak to us that we may heed the invitation to get off Satan's train to perdition. Are you going to say amen, friends? That's why we're studying the Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 3. We must get out of God's way. We must heed God's straight message for these last days. And there are many people who are still on milk. Who do not want the meat of God's word. They do not want present truth. They do not want to see their sins. Nor the sins of the church. But we're told that we need a living pointed testimony. And God will have to tell his ministers. Who are not preaching that testimony. To get out of his way. I don't want to be in the way. I want God to speak his word to us today. Are right, you going to say amen? Revelation chapter 3. Now friends. This church. The last church. Has departed from Christ, the church of Laodicea. There's a distance between Laodicea and Christ. We've been studying this for the past few weeks. 
How do we know there's a distance? In Revelation 3 verse 20, the Bible says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice, I will what? Come in. And I will sup with him, and he with me. So the fact that Christ says, I will come in, is evidence he's not in them right now. The fact that he says, I will be with them, and they with me, is evidence that there's a distance right now. So there's a distance between the church and Christ in these last days. Are you with me? Say amen. And we must understand the condition of the church. We must understand our condition before Christ comes. That we may repent and come out of this condition. Now let me ask you a question. Does the Bible say that the sheep know the master? The sheep hear my voice and follow me? So does the sheep know their master? Yes or no? Does the sheep know the shepherd? Now let me ask you another question. Does the shepherd know the sheep? Yes. That means that the shepherd knows the condition of the sheep. And just like Jesus knows the condition of the sheep, Jesus knows the condition of the church. He wants us also to know the condition of the church. Did you know that, friends? Look at this. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. It says, Be thou diligent to know the state, the condition, the state of the, thy flocks. And look well to thy herds. So the Bible says we are to know the condition of the church. Are right, you saying amen? And how many don't want to study the testimonies, don't want to read what this been prophecy says, don't want to see the condition of the church. We want to speak highly about these things. But the Bible says we need to know the condition of the church. Are right, you saying amen? And people, when they hear the messages that show the condition of the church, they say you're attacking the church. No, friends. We need to know, according to the Bible, the condition of the flock. Are you to be saying amen? Why? Because when the sheep know that there, there's, a, there's a distance between them and Jesus, then they can run to Jesus and that distance can be removed. But if we don't know the condition of the church, that means there will forever be. A distance between us and Jesus, and if Christ closes probation with that distance, we will be lost. Are you going to say amen? We need a pointed testimony. Someone need to lift up their voice. We're told in Proverbs 22 and verse 3, A prudent man foreseeth the evil, and hideth himself, but the simple pass on, and are punished. Those who see the condition of the church, those who see the evil in their lives, the evil in the church, they will run and hide in Jesus. Are you going to say amen? And it's time for us to see our condition that we do what? We run to Jesus. All right, we say amen. That's it. We run to Jesus. Revelation chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 14. Let's read together, friends. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says, And unto the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, Christ speaking now. Verse 15. I know thy works. Does Jesus know the condition of the church? Yes or no? Verse 15. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, in the middle, lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So the Bible says in verse 15, that Jesus knows the condition of the church. He says, I know your works. But the church says in verse 17 that they know not. So we don't know our own condition, but Christ knows our condition. All right, we say amen. That's why we need to heed the message of the straight testimony so that we know the condition of the church. We know our own condition in these last days. All right? Sister White clearly says, what is the condition of the church? Testimony to the church, volume 1, page 210, paragraph 2. I was shown the low state of God's people. We're going to stay on this quotation the whole message. I was shown the low state of God's people that God had not departed from them but that they had departed from him and had become lukewarm. So let's stop there. Why is the Laodicean church lukewarm? Because they departed from Christ. There's a distance between the church and Christ. It goes on to say they possess the theory of the truth. They know the truth. But lack, it's what? It's saving power. And as we near the close of time, Satan comes down with great power, knowing that his time is short, especially will, he, will his power be exercised upon who in these last days? The remnant. 
So the, the power of Satan is going to be on God's remnant professed keeping people. It's a low level of spirituality. She says they have the theory of the truth, but not its saving power. And there's a distance between the church and Christ. Not because Christ disconnected himself from the church, but because the people have left and departed from Christ. The great departure. Are you going to say amen? She saw that people were basically connected to Satan, a low spiritual level in the church. Satan's power was over them, a low spirituality, a departure from God, a lacking its saving power, and Satan had power over those people in the church who professed to be God's remnant keeping people. Should this alarm us, friends? Should this make us see, Lord, where do I stand in my relationship with you? Because we're told in these last days that many are going to depart from the faith. Many are going to depart from Christ. Many are departing from Christ because Satan is exercising his power on the remnant. And notice it says they will depart from Christ. They will still attend church. They will still have Bibles. They will still sing Sabbath after Sabbath. They will still enjoy Sabbath school and sermons. They will still love the fellowship of believers, but they are in a low spirituality state. They have no power, and Satan is exercising his power over them. And they departed from Christ. We're told that this is a message for the last days. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times, the last days, that some shall depart from the faith, from Christ, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in these last days, many are going to depart from Christ, from the faith, from God's word. They will still be in the church, but depart from Christ. Do we see the condition of the church? Now, friends, listen. What does Jesus ask us to do in Revelation chapter 3? To come out of this condition, all right? We said three things. I'm going to repeat these things again. We said last week, God asks us to behold. All right, let's go back. He asks us to buy, Revelation 3, verse 18. He asks us to repent, Revelation 3, 19. He asks us to behold. All right, follow this now. He asks us to buy, repent, and behold. Verse 18, Revelation 3, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, white raiment that thou mayest be rich. It says, that thou, right raiment, I'm sorry, gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Right raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness will not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes of that thou mayest see. So he says, buy. Right? Verse 19, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and what? Repent. So number, the second thing is repent. Verse number 20, he says, behold. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So three things Christ asks us to do is buy, repent, and what? Behold, I put an acronym, BRB. In the world, that's right. that means, right, be right back. If we're living for the world, it's time to say, you know what, I'll be right back. I'm going to buy from Jesus. I'm going to invest in a relationship with Christ. I will receive his righteousness. I will receive the experience of gold tried in the fire. I will have eyes solved now to see. God's truth in these last days. I will have eyes solved now to see. My condition that I may repent. The condition of the church that we may repent. Be right back. BRB. Buy, repent, and behold. So that we can come out of the Laodicean condition. Christ saw we must be right back. All right, we say amen. So don't forget that, friends. BRB. You heard it here. Present to heal. I don't hear any other ministry say this. Are you thinking? BRB. Be right back. But buy, repent, and behold to come out of the lukewarm condition. Now let me ask you a question. Is the church becoming more lukewarm? Yes or no? Is this generation, are they finding no need of Christ? And not just the Adventist church, but churches all over the world. People are losing their love for Christ, their love for the study of God's word, their love for the Bible. Their love for their upbringing. They grew up in the church and many have left the church. Watch this, friends. All right. Statista. This is a, a, a news uh, uh, website. It says, the decline of Christianity, where? In the United States. This is March 28, 2024. So There's a decline of Christianity all over the world, but especially in the United States. Now watch what it says. I just want to read the first sentence. I know you cannot be able to see that well. It says, Christianity is on the decline in the United States. Uh, one more time. Christianity is in the decline in the United States. 
New data from Gallup shows that the church attendance has dropped across all pulled, uh, all pulled Christian groups. Let's stop there. So Christianity is dropping in America. The lack of spirituality is dropping. Christianity and church attendance is dropping in America. Now, friends, the Bible says that the Sunday law is going to pass. But before that time passes, the Bible says, we're going to study this today, that there's going to be what? A falling away first. And many people are falling away from the Bible, from Christ, and have no desire in America, all over the world. And watch this. It goes on to say, according to Gallup's data, it says, this decline in church attendance among Christians speaks to the wider pattern across religion in the U.S. generally. So it says this is a decline in different religions, different denominations in the U.S. Now, friends, look at this. Church attendance declines in the U.S. Watch this. All right. They did a, they did a, a, a survey from 2001 to 2003. And then again, from 2021 to 2023. And look at the difference. All right. The Mormon church, there was a decline. Only 1%. The Protestant Christian Church, there was a decline, 4%, right? The Catholic Church, there was a decline, 12%, all right? The Orthodox Church, there was a decline, all right? 6%. So in different denominations, religions, all over, all over the world, they're seeing there is a decline in what? Spirituality, Christian attendance, going to church. So let me ask you a question. Are we far from Christ in this last generation? As a generation, as a people... Yes, friends. Many people have no desire for God. There's a decline in church attendance. Secularism, materialism is taking the place of spirituality. Buying the fancy cars, the fancy houses, being caught up in social media, different apps, being caught up and trying to live like the world is taking the place of the Bible. Yes. People are trying to be famous on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. They have no time for God. That's what's happening, friends. The morals of society are going down, right? Also, since COVID-19, many people don't attend church anymore because they'd rather watch it online. And some who watch online don't even want to go to church. So they stop watching online. There has been a decline in spirituality in the U.S. And there's a shift in the culture. Churches are now changing because they realize people are leaving. So they're trying to bring in different methods to bring them back into the church. Drums, music, dance hall. Get the young people into entertainment. Get them to dance. Get them to have fun. Bring in the different things in the church because there's a decline. But friends, we need more of Jesus and the word. Those things will not bring people back to Christ. Right? We say amen. They may come back to church, but still far from Christ, which is the Laodicean condition. Look at this now, friends. American secularism is growing and growing more Complicated. This is January 14, 2022. So American secularism, secularism is growing, which means Christianity, spirituality is decreasing. Watch this. Americans are getting less religious. You probably heard it. They do fewer traditional, tr traditionally religious things, such as belonging to a denomination, attending worship services, or feeling that God even exists. So this nation is becoming, according to this article, more and more atheistic. Are you with me saying amen? More and more atheistic. No desire to attend church. No desire to open a Bible. Why is this alarming for us, friends? Watch. You're going to see the connections. You're going to see the dots in just a moment. So we're seeing that the nation is becoming more and more Christ-like. More and more, less and less religious. Less and less Christ-like. Less and less religious. It goes on to say... Has the rise of religious nuns come to an end in the U.S.? So instead of using the word nun, like N-U-N, they use the word nun, N-O-N-E-S, which means many people are saying, I have no desire, no, none. I am not a part of any church, none. I don't read my Bible, none at all, right? They ask if it's coming to an end, and the answer is no. It goes on to say, in Pew Research Centers, it says, uh, 2023 polling, 28% of the U.S. adults are religiously unaffiliated, describing themselves as atheists, agnostic, or simply nothing, in particular when asked about religion. Now, friends, listen. We're seeing that the nation is becoming more and more godless and more and more 
atheistic in mindset. They don't want God. They don't want the Bible. They don't even attend church. Now, friends, the Bible says right before the coming of the Lord, there is going to be what? A falling away? Falling away first. Do we see this falling away today? And let me tell you where this falling away is going to lead to. Let's go in our Bible to the book of 2 Thessalonians. All right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This falling away is going to lead to the Sunday law. This falling away is going to lead to the papacy, pushing Sunday as a day of rest. Now, how do we know? Listen, look at this article on the screen as we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, modeling the future of religion in America. All right? Modeling the future of religion in America. Since 1990s, large numbers of Americans have left Christianity to join the growing rates of U.S. adults who describe their religious identity as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. The accelerating trend is reshaping in the U.S. religious landscape, leading many people to wonder, that's what it should say, wonder, what their future of religion in America might look like. So many people are becoming atheist, agnostic, or want nothing to do with God. Now, how will this lead to the mark of the beast crisis? All right, go with me in your Bible. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. You with me now? All right, friends. The Bible says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Are you guys still with me? All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse, verse 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord. This is talking about a sign of Christ's coming. The Lord Jesus Christ by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind. What our people are in these articles doing? They're shaking in their mind. They don't want God, right? Shaken in mind. Or troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, which is the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord shall not come, Except there be a falling away first. Do we see that, friends? All these articles are showing the word of God is true. There's a falling away first. And then it says, And that the Son of Man be revealed, the Son of Perdition. So this falling away will lead to what? The Son of... The Man of Sin being... Uh, it says, The falling away first, that the Man of Sin be revealed. So this falling away will lead to the, son, the Man of Sin coming. Verse 4 now says, Who imposed and exalted himself above all that is called God, or all that is worship, so that he, as God, sit in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. So how will this point to the papacy? Listen, as the nation is becoming more godless, more atheistic, more agnostic, people don't want anything to do with God, the nation is going to say, you know what, we need to fix this problem. Let's force religion on the people. Let's bring in atheistic, uh, let's bring in the papacy's principles. Let's begin to bring people back to Sunday worship because this law, this nation is becoming lawless, is becoming sinful. They have no desire for the Bible, no desire to attend church. Let's force it upon them. Do you see that point? Say amen, friends. That's it. That's why we see these current events to let us know a Sunday law is on its way. When people say, I have no desire for God, just know, just know that if the nation see this as a people, we're losing a desire for God. No one's attending church. They will force it upon us in these last days. Oh, it's coming. It goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, even him who is coming is after the working of Satan. What's our topic? The great departure, Satan to exercise his power on the remnant. The working of Satan with all power. Signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So Satan will work in a deceptive way to bring about quote unquote righteousness, but it will be unrighteousness as a law in the land to pass Sunday as a day of rest. And notice what this says here. Great Controversy, page 443. It says, when the early church became corrupted. By departing from the simplicity of the gospel, like many are departing from the word of God now in those articles, and except heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God, 
And in, con in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. The result, watch this, the result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to its further, to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. Goes on to say, it was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of civil government, and this prepared the way for the development of the papacy, the beast, said Paul. There shall come a falling away first, we saw, we saw that, and then the Son of Man will be revealed. So it goes on to say, so apostasy in the church will prepare the way for the image to be, to, to, for the image to the beast. Do we see this, friends? So this is showing us that as a generation, the condition of the nation is a Laodicean, lukewarm condition. They don't want to be close to Christ. What will happen? This will result in church and state uniting and the papacy passing their laws. Do you understand this, friends? Oh, man, we're at the end. Very soon we're going to see a Sunday law. The Pope is making moves. G7 summit. He's going to be speaking there next month. The nations that will be there, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom, United Nations, things are moving while Satan has his people in a stupor, while Satan is working his power upon the church. He's moving. He's preparing the way. So what must we do? BRB, be right back. It's time to buy of Christ. It's time to repent from sin, and it's time to behold Jesus. Are you with me saying amen? Why does Christ ask us to repent? from sin, all right? Now, I want to encourage you. Why does God ask us to repent from sin? Listen, would you tell your children to do something if you believe you can't, if, they, if you believed that they couldn't do it? No, you tell your kids to do something because you believe that they can do it, right? God is asking us to repent because he sees that we will be perfect. We can be perfect if we surrender to him and walk with him. He sees the possibility of perfection in all of us through his son, Jesus Christ. Right? We say amen. You can be perfect as you surrender your life to him, receive his righteousness, and walk with Christ every day. He sees perfection. That's why he says repent. He will never tell you to do something if he doesn't believe you can be perfect. Now the Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And the reason why Christ rebukes us 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for rebuke, or correction, right? For correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Does God see that we can be perfect? Is that the reason why he's rebuking us? Is that the reason why he's telling us to remove this distance between us and Jesus? Is that the reason why he's telling us to get an interest back in God's word? Yes, friends. He sees that we can be perfect. He's calling us to repent. Now watch this. I love this. Titus chapter 1 and verse 13. The witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Remember we talked about appointed testimony? Rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. Christ sees that we can hold on to him. We can be a Peter after his fall. We can be the ones preaching on the day of Pentecost. We can bring many into the truth of God. But he asks us to repent, friends. And praise God. God is not done with his church. He's still pleading with them, though the devil is exercising his power over them. Now watch this, friends. We're going to study this deep today. I was shown, because this is not just for those in the world and other denominations, but I had to show them, show that first in the world. But I also now want to deal with the church, because she says, I was shown the low state of God's people. This is the remnant church. That God had not departed from them, but that they had departed from him and had become lukewarm. They professed the theory of the truth, the Sabbath, to say the dead, 20th year prophecy. They, they professed and possessed the theory of the truth, 1844, the, the sanctuary. They possessed the theory of the truth, Daniel and Revelation. But they lack its saving power. And as we near the close of time, Satan comes down with great power, knowing that his time is short, especially will, he, will his power be exercised upon the remnant. Question, is Satan now doing this upon God's SDA church? Is the devil now working in a way to bring his power on the SDA church, friends? Oh yes, friends, it's happening. I want to show you this, friends.
Look at that, friends. Adventist school. Now, friends, listen. What I want to say is that if you would hear the music to this video, it is derogatory. It is sexually immoral. It is corrupt. It is in Spanish. I don't understand Spanish. So I, I talked to my wife, and she was able to tell me the words that were to the song. And the words were very immoral. And children are dancing to this in Adventist schools. And not only that, the leaders were there supporting it, encouraging it. No one stopped this. So let me ask you a question. Is Satan exercising his power on the church? Yes or no? We see it very clearly, friends. Even today, it's hard to find a place of worship where there's no drums, where there's no compromise. Now, are there Adventists preaching the truth on the pulpit? Yes, there are some. Now, don't ask me where they are. I don't know. But God has a few. But the majority of the church are experiencing the exercising of Satan's power. And we're told in Selected Messages, book 2, page 36 and 38, a bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which it conducted aright might be a blessing. Remember the train, Satan is the conductor? The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to a carnival. And this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. And those which have been in the past, those which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by which it is conducted. So we're seeing, friends, that people don't want the straight testimony. They don't want the living pointed truth. And Satan is exercising his power on the church. Even now, churches are changing on this island as well. Things are being brought in the church. Satan is exercising his power. There's a great departure from Christ. Friends, I, I, I have to preach what God gave me. Are you with me? I have to. I don't want to be in God's way. All right? Again, I was shown the low state of God's people that they had not departed from them. Uh, he had not departed from them, but they had departed from him. They had become lukewarm. They possessed the theory of the truth, but, the, but they lack its saving power. As we near the close of time, Satan comes down with great power, knowing that this time is short, especially will his power be exercised upon the remnant. Watch this one, friends. This is the college. I pause the music to avoid... You know, this type of worship is normal in certain places. I remember going to preach in different Adventist churches, and the music was so bad, my parents were outside waiting for the sermon to start so I can speak. I was in a pastor's room praying, asking the Lord, are you sure you want me to preach this, Lord? The Lord said, yes, I brought you here to preach this. Now, friends, uneasy, uncomfortable I was preaching in these places. But this is normal in some churches. God is saying there must be a living, pointed testimony. Now, do we have a message of uplifting Jesus, our wonderful Savior? Yes. We need to preach in balance and in love the message. But we also must call sin, sin, and lead God's people to repentance. Are you saying amen, friends? Yes, that's it. I was shown the low state of God's people, that they, God had departed from them, but that they departed from him. Last line, Satan comes down with great power, knowing that his time is short, especially now he's exercising his power upon the remnant. There's so much compromise in the church nowadays. Women being elected as pastors and leaders of God's flock, when there's no Bible or spirit of prophecy that condones women pastors. Now friends, we're told the order of the Home should be the same order of the church. Who's the leader of the home? It is the man. So who would God put in the place in the church? But what are many SDA conferences doing? They're hiring what? Women pastors. This goes against counsel, friends. All right, we say amen. Yes, it goes against counsel. There's a work for women to do. Women can do so much for the Lord. They can do Bible studies. Women can even raise up, they can raise up a people. But to be a leader ahead of a church in the position of a male, the Bible says, be a husband of what? One wife. Are you with me saying that, friends? Listen, just recently, there was another pastor. Her name is Pastor 
They call her Pastor Joanna Cortez. At recently, she was just hired by the same conference here, the Potemic, well, the Potemic Conference. And notice that she is going to be speaking at an event called the Kinship Worship. Now, I want us to see what's happening in the church, friends. This Friday, join us for Kinship Worship, an inspirational program for us, by us. We welcome an ally and guest speaker, Pastor Joanna Cortez. It says the live broadcast starts at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our Facebook page and YouTube. It says join us for Kinship Worship. Now, does anyone know what Kinship Worship is? All right, I got their logo and their official statement from their website. Watch this. Seventh Day Adventist Kinship International. We are, this is from their website, we are an inclusive community that embraces the LGBTQIA plus individuals and allies with a connection, with a connection, with a connection to the Seventh Day Adventist faith. Is Satan exercising his power on the remnant, friends? We need a sharp testimony. So they bring in these different people living that ungodly lifestyle with no message to ask them to turn from sin, with no message of repentance, with no message showing them that Jesus died for their sins to save them from their sins. It's just a message just to worship with them and make them feel good. Oh, friends, that is not Christ's method. And on their website, Kingship International, a drag queen. This is happening in the church among God's people. Oh, friends, did Christ want us to do that, friends? Our method in, in mingling with people in the in Ministry of Healing, page 143, is that we tell them to follow Jesus. Not just to have worship with them and send them home and fill, no, no, no. We, we, we mingle with people to tell them you need to follow who? Jesus. Ministry of Healing, page 143. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. His method alone, the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed them their sympathy. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. And then he bade them what? Follow me. So we can't just say, I'm going to mingle with you and that's all. No, no, no. I need to tell you that eventually you must what? Follow Christ. And Christ does not promote that lifestyle, that sin. Are you with me saying amen, friends? So this woman ordination, it opened the door for the LGBT plus community. The XYZ, I don't know what they say. Are you with me? It opened the door. And that's why if we throw one principle of God down, we throw the others down. It's a domino effect. Are you with me? And she says, I, the Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter the, upon the closing work. Every truth that he has get, given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every truth. Even the truth about women's ordination. Oh, friends. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into a new organization for this would mean, this would mean, this would mean apostasy from the truth. So this is taking place in the church. Sister White says, I saw that Satan's power would be exercised upon the remnant. We're seeing it today, friends. We're living in perilous times, having a form of godliness and no power, separated from Christ. And the Bible says, because iniquity, sin is abounding, the love of many will wax cold. The love for the Bible, the love for Bible truth, the love for the word of God. All right, can we say amen? Yes, friends, that's what's happening in the church. Now, friends, we've been looking at this quotation over and over again. But this quotation is not just for the people in the pews. It's also for those in position of leadership. Watch this, friends. We're told Satan's chief work is at the headquarters of our faith. What are the headquarters? The general conference. He spares those pains to corrupt men in responsible positions to persuade them to be unfaithful to their several trusts. So Satan is working, whispering in the ears of those in the general conference position to sway them from their trust, and he's working hard at the headquarters of our faith. You know, I want to sincerely give my heartfelt, my heartfelt prayers and comfort and support to the family of Diop, 
you know, he's suffering a heart attack, and we need to pray for him. He suffered a heart attack this week. And I believe with all my heart, we need to pray not just for his healing, that the Lord will recover him, but also for his conversion, right? For his repentance. Just recently, he had a heart attack. He was going to speak at some place, but he was canceled. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is Sister White says Satan's going to work at the headquarters of our faith. And watch this video, friends, where he says that his work is to connect with people of other faith. Because when we mingle, then they get to know who we are. And they start developing confidence and trust, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et now, I don't explain this everywhere so that to let people look what I'm doing. That's nothing to do with that. Okay? But it can be helpful. All right. So you saw the flyer there. The flyer, he, he's there for an annual meeting of Global Christian Forum where they ask him to preach on unity. Now, let me ask you a question. Can we be united with those that don't agree upon the truth that we have? Right? So in order to be unity, there must be an agreement upon truth, Bible truth. So in order for him to meet with these individuals and have unity, he has to throw away the third angel's message. You can't preach those things. I won't call you Babylon so we can be united. I won't tell you that you have the, that if you continue worshiping this way, and when the, the decree comes, that you will receive the mark of the beast. I won't tell you that we believe that you will receive the seven last plagues. I won't tell you that you are Babylon. We will unite upon things that we have in common. Do you see that, friends? All right. Notice this. Why is this dangerous? She says here, when the leading churches of the United States are uniting upon such doctrines, they try to find things that are in common, such doctrines as held by them in common, they shall influence her, and enforce their, her, their decrees to sustain their institutions. Then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will, be inevit will inevitably result. Right? So trying to unite upon principles that we have in common and throwing away three angels' messages to do so will lead to the enforcement of a Sunday law, the image of the beast setting up, church and state uniting. Do we see this, friends? This is happening with the higher ups. Satan is working at the headquarters of our faith. Now watch this, friends. He says that the Seventh-day Adventist church is an ecumenical movement. Question, are we an ecumenical movement? Are we the Advent movement? We stand out and are different from the rest of the world. We're not like the evangelical movement and connecting with all these denominations. We have a standout message. Now watch this first. Let me first shock you. Sure. You know, and then after that, you say, we Adventists should be the most ecumenical people in the whole wild world. Okay. okay. Why do I say that? Do we not say we have an everlasting gospel to preach to the whole world? That's oikumene. Mm -hmm. All right. He says we are an ecumenical movement. We have a gospel to preach to the whole world. Therefore, that makes us an ecumenical movement. Now, friends, are we supposed to be mingled with the world in that way? Mm -mm. We're supposed to lead them to the truth. But this is what's happening in the church, friends. Sister White says, as we get ready to bring this to a close. All right. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke for the what? The Protestant world. Our message is should rebuke, and our mission should rebuke the rest of the Protestant world. Not unite, rebuke. Not because we want to rebuke them, but we need, uh, again, the literacy message is to lead people to repentance. Are you with me? But what does Christ say? He says, if we stay in this lukewarm condition, he wants to puke us out of his mouth. So instead of being a standing rebuke, the church makes Christ want to puke. That's the condition of the church, friends. That's why we must see the condition of the church, and not just the church, but even ourselves, to see if we are mingling with the world. We have a direct message, friends, right? We say amen. All right? Listen, Satan's stream. Here we go. I saw, I saw with rapidity with, with, with which this delusion was spreading. A train of cars was shown me going with lightning speed, going with lightning speed of lightning. The angel bade me look carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board and there was none left. It says that, said the angel, they are binding the bundles ready to burn. Then he, he showed me the conductor and he appeared like a stately fear person. Kind of looked like this person right here. Whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. 
it, I was perplexed and asked my attending angel who it was. And he said, it is Satan. He is the conductor in the form of an angel of light. And he has taken the world captive. Satan has a train. And she saw those of the world are on it. And when she was trying to find God's people, the angel said, listen, if you want to find God's people, look in the opposite direction. It says, Elamite uh, plaintively inquired if there were none left. The angel told her, look in the opposite direction. And I saw a little company traveling a narrow pathway. All seemed to be firmly united, bound together by the truth of God. In bundles and or in companies, said the angel. The third angel is binding and sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garner. This little company looked careworn as if they had passed through severe trials and conflicts. And it had appeared as if the sun had just risen from behind a cloud shone upon their countenances, causing them to look triumphant as if their victories were nearly won. So the train was going in one direction. But God's people standing on truth were going in the complete opposite direction. And friends, let me tell you something. If you stand up for God and his truth, it will seem as if you are standing in a direction that is opposite than where the, when, where, than where the world is heading and also where the church is heading. At large, many are entering at the wide gate to destruction, friends. That's it. So Jesus says, as we bring this to a close, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man does what? Hear my voice. I will open the door and will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Now let me ask you a question. How do we hear the voice of God? As we bring this to a close. Look at this. Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spoke... In times past, unto the fathers, by what? The prophets. So how do we hear God's voice? The prophets. Did the prophets write the word? Old Testament, New Testament? God's voice is heard through the word, through the prophets. In John chapter 1, the Bible says that John the Baptist was in the wilderness. And John the Baptist, a prophet of God, he was, it says, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the what? Wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, it said the prophet Isaiah. So John the Baptist was a voice. Now let me ask you a question. Those who heeded the message of John the Baptist, did they accept Christ? Yes. So that means that the voice of John the Baptist was equal to the voice of Christ. He was one speaking on behalf of Christ. If that makes sense, say amen. So when the Bible says, if any man hear my voice, that is spoken by the prophets, he will what? So if we reject the spirit of prophecy, will we receive Christ in our hearts? Ephesians chapter 4 says, The Holy Spirit is sending gifts upon men, and one of those gifts are for the prophets, that we come into the full stature of Christ. So friends, there is a need to come back to the living testimony, to the spirit of prophecy. All right, we say amen. We have to come back to this. All right? As we bring this to a close, Christ says, If any man hear my voice, so if we're waiting for the whole church to change, it's not going to change. It's an individual work. We must let Christ in. If any man hear my voice, some people are trying to fight in, in different places, holding up the light. No, no, no. If any man hear my voice, if they reject you, find somewhere else. Now, some churches are still walking in the light of God. There are some still pastors holding up the truth, right? But if they reject it's only for individuals. Because if we're waiting for the whole church to be converted, that time will what? It will never come. So this is why we need a point to testimony. Now watch this, friends. It's a personal work we must enter as we bring this to a close. The Lord has thoughts of mercy concerning you and will not forsake you unless you forsake him. You are in a lukewarm condition. Let's all take this personally, friends, as God is speaking to us and must be aroused and make efforts for salvation, or they will feel of everlasting life. They must feel, we must feel, an individual responsibility to have an experience for ourselves. They work. They need a work. We need a work wrought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God, which will lead us, lead them, lead us 
to love and choose the society of God's people above any other and be separate from those who have no love for spiritual things. This message will cause us to find a love for Jesus and to be separated from those who do not love spiritual things, even if they're in the church. Do you see that? Say amen. All right, I'm bringing this to a close. Jesus demands a whole sacrifice, an entire consecration. You have not realized that God requires your undivided attentions. He wants us fully. You have made a, a, made a holy profession, yet sunk down to the dead level of ordinary professors. You love the society of the young who have no regard for the sacred truths you profess. You have appeared like your associates and have been contented with as much religion as would render you agreeable to all without incurring censor of any. So friends, listen, all of us have to enter this individual work. If we're going to stand for truth in Christ, God wants you to be separate from the world. He wants you to be his own. Jesus is jealous over you. You know that? Ellen White says, guard jealously your hours of prayer and the study of God's word. Jesus is jealous over you. He wants you all to himself. And if anything, anyone, any sin, anything is separating you from Christ, you must enter this work individually. We must pray for those in going in the wrong direction. Yes, we must sign cry. We must point out what's happening. But at the same time, we must enter an individual work. All right, we say amen. Now, that does not mean stop sighing and crying because they're going to be that way anyway. So let's just focus on individual. No, no, we have to have balance. While we focus on individual work, we still should preach a pointed message and lead people by God's grace to repentance. All right, we say amen. So friends, listen, that's why we talked about this today. And my prayer is if that if there's any sin in our lives separating us from Christ that is causing this distance, it's time to remove. Satan is exercising his power, but it doesn't have to be over us. Are you with me? All oh, friends, listen, if we pray, if we fast, if we ask God, for victory over sin and invite Jesus into our hearts and daily commune with him. Open the Bible's prayer prophecy. He will stretch out his righteousness upon us. Just imagine yourself filthy, filled with sin. You know your life. You know how unworthy you are. And imagine Christ saying, listen, this is given to you. My free gift is for you. Imagine Christ saying, listen, I know that you have sin, you have, you have uh, weaknesses, but listen, I will put you in trials to refine you, to make you more like me. When we think about it that way, it encourages us. Let's buy of Christ. Repent and behold him. Amen? BRB. All right, friends, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this message today. We see our need of a Savior. We see our need for your church to have you back in our lives. Lord, Satan has still a march upon us. He's exercising his power upon profess Christians. May we examine ourselves. If Satan is exercising power upon us, we want to buy of you, Father. We want to repent earnestly, deeply and sincerely, and we want to behold Jesus every day. Make us more like you. We must enter this work individually. If we're waiting for the whole church to be converted, that time will never come. But we still must bear the point of testimony. For you may have others that may hear the message and repent before it's too late. But help us to realize it's an individual work with Christ. Lord, help us. Save us, we pray. Reclaim us as your own. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit. Cover us with thy righteousness as we turn from the sins in our hearts that separate us from Christ. Please hear and answer our prayer today. May we leave here different than how we walked in. Is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.